And finally, I've got Mrs. Clark. She's early 80s and had replacement hip surgery two weeks ago. Right. She has a Eskin bundle and her care agency are aware of this, but she's higher risk for pressure ulcer since the surgery. She has a grade two ulcer on her sacrum that she acquired in the hospital. I want to talk to her about having pressure relieving aids at home. I have some concerns about her capacity though. She was recently diagnosed as early stage Alzheimer's. Okay. Well, you know the principles of the Mental Capacity Act, so let them guide you. Uh, you will need to show evidence that you've used them in any actions that you take. Will do. And try and find out about any support she has for her decision making. I know you said her daughter's a, her family advocate. Mm -hmm. Maybe see if she's got lasting power of attorney for health and welfare as well and you'll need to see a copy of the document for the file. The Mental Capacity Act of 2005 enables adults who have an impairment or disturbance of the mind or brain, whether permanent or temporary, that affects their ability to make decisions to have the support they may require to exercise their legal right to make decisions. It also requires their preferences to be respected if they're proved unable to decide, and a decision must be constructed in their best interests. In this film, we see how you can apply the principles of the Mental Capacity Act in your everyday practice to ensure that everyone gets the very best care you can offer to support their health and well-being. Hi, I'm Kate, the district nurse from Hands Own Richmond Community yeah, Health. Yeah, of course, come in. Mum's in the lounge. Thank you. The first principle states that we must always assume a person has capacity to make a decision unless it's proved otherwise. Capacity is not a diagnosis and no one ever has to prove their own capacity. Morning, Mrs. Clark. How are you today? Is it good to be back at home? Oh, sorry, dear. Do you feel better now that you're at home rather than at the hospital? Oh, yes, yes. I take things at my own pace now. Uh... I'm glad you're happy to be home. And I'd like to be able to help you stay here safely without having to go back to the hospital. If I'm honest, I'm a little worried about your sore bottom. It's important that we keep your skin healthy and pain-free. You really need a special type of bed and chair here in your home. I can order these for you, but I would need your consent. I know you have had some memory problems recently, so I want to make sure I give you any help you might need to agree to this. I have some photos on my phone of the sort of thing I'm thinking about. Can I show you and talk about how they would help you? The second principle states that you must take all practicable steps to support people to make their own decisions. This recognises that we all process information differently and may need different support and assistance when it comes to decision making. So you see, they've been designed especially to avoid you getting another sore, or the small one you have getting worse. I don't want my home looking like a hospital. It won't, Mum. I don't, say, I don't want another sore either. Uh. If you're happy, I'll order them for you straight away. I just need to check with you what you heard me say about them. Oh yes, well, um, you said I should have a bed and a chair like the ones in the pictures so that I don't get a sore bottom again. <laughs> All right, I'll give them a try. OK, I'll order them for you and the company will be in touch about deliveries and showing you how to use them. I'm glad you were able to make your own decision about this today. That might not always be the case it would be a good idea to talk to your daughter or someone else you trust about having a lasting power of attorney. That would mean someone like Liz can help you make decisions like this in the future if you're unable to. She seems to know you well and she seems to understand what's important to you. Okay. Oh, Auntie Anna's got one so she can tell you all about it. Okay, great. I had some concerns about Mrs Clark's capacity to consent to pressure relieving equipment due to her memory problems. I visited her mid-morning when I know she is usually most alert. Her daughter Liz was present so I explained in simple terms why she would benefit from the equipment and showed her pictures. Mrs Clark was able to understand the risk and the decision needed and was able to communicate her consent.
I recommended that they consider an LPA to help with future decisions. The third principle of the Mental Capacity Act states that a person must not be treated as unable to make a decision merely because they make an unwise decision. As a professional or carer, you must be aware of the values you bring to a conversation about mental capacity. Is the person making a valid decision you consider unwise? Are they just refusing to engage? Or do they really lack capacity to make that decision at that time? Your recording should reassure you and others that you've taken an objective view. What matters in this conversation is the person's ability to understand information about the options available to them, retain the information long enough to weigh it up, and to make and communicate a decision. This is sometimes called the functional test of mental capacity. So you see, they've been designed especially to avoid you getting another sore, or the small one you have getting worse. Well, they're all very nice, really. But I have a bed already. Where will I put another one? I'm sure we can find some space. We but can I do it don't together. Want... You can put it in the window. And that way you could have your morning tea while looking out of the garden. In here? But this is the lounge. No, I don't want my home looking like a hospital. I've had my bed since I got married. And, and this was my brother's favourite chair. And it's good enough for me. I see. It is a lovely soft chair, but it doesn't protect your skin very well. It can't be easy to get in and out of. I can answer the door if I need to. Can I just check with you what you heard me say about the new bed and the new chair? I'd like to get your consent so I can order them for you. Bless you, dear. But I'm not interested. I really don't want these things cluttering up my house. Uh, I have a carer coming in every day already. I, I like my home just as it is. And what if you get another bad sore, Mum? Well, maybe I'll think again. Your professional duty of care does not end because someone makes an unwise decision not to accept advice or help. Respect and record their decision, but keep their options open. Lynn, I need to let you know as a nurse, I think this is unwise. You remember the Eskin bundle we looked at together with your carer? Well, maybe you and Liz can look through it again to remind you about the risks to your skin at this time. However, I respect your decision today. Perhaps we could discuss it again at my next visit. And maybe at the same time, we could discuss with you and Liz how you can have help to make decisions like this in the future. Mrs. Clark was able to understand and weigh up the risk and was able to communicate her decision not to have any pressure relieving equipment at this time. I let her know this is an unwise decision and we'll discuss this with her again at our next visit when I'll also discuss an LPA. Capacity is decision specific. People may have capacity to make some decisions, but not others. Capacity is also time-specific. Recognising when a decision can and should be delayed to another time to give the person the best chance of making the decision is important. So, you see, they're designed especially to avoid getting another sore. Excuse me, I need to go to the toilet again. I can do it, Ronnie. Sorry. My mum's not her normal self. She's got a water infection. Oh, right. Oh, it's okay. The GP came yesterday and gave her antibiotics, so she's on the mend. But her memory's getting even worse. 
Earlier she thought I was her sister Evie, and she's been dead for years. I see. Ronnie! You okay, Mum? I'm really tired. It's bedtime yet. Your daughter Liz mentioned that you're not feeling very well today. I'll come back soon when you're feeling better and we can talk then, okay? Bye. Come on, Mum. I noted that she has a UTI at present, which is affecting her memory. The TVN has assessed her grade two pressure ulcer, which is granulating with no signs of deterioration. Therefore, I will delay this decision until she is back to her baseline to give her the best chance of making her own decision. In the meantime, her Eskin bundle and wound care plan are in place. So you see they've been designed especially to avoid getting another sore. That sounds like a great idea, Mum. Hmm? So you don't get any sores like last time, yes? Are you staying to dinner, dear? No, Mum, she's not. I need to know, you know. No, thank you, Mrs Clark. Do you have any questions about this bed or this chair? Can you tell me what you heard me say about them? Uh, why don't I leave you two girls to it? Uh, don't stay up too late, though. You've got school in the morning. All right, Mum. Won't be long. When there is evidence that someone lacks capacity to make a decision such as consent to healthcare, we move on to Principles 4 and 5 of the Mental Capacity Act. Principle 4 says that any action done for or on behalf of a person who lacks mental capacity must be done in their best interests. This is not about what a reasonable person would decide, it is about what that person would decide if they could. Alongside this, Principle 5 says that any action should be the less restrictive option of those available for that person. It seems to me like your mum's not able to understand her options today, would you agree? Mm. Her memory's got a lot worse, that's for sure, but you know, other than that she's okay. Does anybody have a lasting power of attorney for health and welfare to make decisions on behalf of your mum? Yes, uh, we arranged that last year. It's me. And have you understood what I've been explaining to your mum? Absolutely, yeah. But is, is there an alternative? Because she does love that chair. And I don't think she'll really cope with all the extra furniture in the house. Well, the alternative would be for your mum to have a better cushion on her chair and a pressure-relieving mattress on her own bed. I was worried you were going to say she had to go into a nursing home because that would just make things worse. I agree. So the mattress and the cushions seem like the better option? Yes. Um, I'll explain it to Mum. I'm sure she'll get used to it. OK. I need to show that you have the legal power to make this decision on her behalf, so I just need to get a photo of the LPA document for your Mum's records. Yeah, of course. I'll fetch it. Mrs Clark was not able to understand the risk or retain the information about the equipment. She lacked capacity to consent. I therefore discussed this with her daughter, who showed me her valid LPA document for health and welfare, a photo of which is attached. We agreed that it is in her mother's best interest to have the mattress and cushion at this point. This is a less restrictive option. The Mental Capacity Act applies to everybody over the age of 16 who has an impairment or a disturbance in the functioning of their mind or brain, which affects their ability to make decisions. Its simple principles guide competent health and social care practice and should be adapted for every individual and every situation. So let's now look at another scenario, this time with Amy, a learning disability community nurse, as she assesses Matthew's capacity to consent to healthcare. So, I know you've had a pain in your tummy for a while now. And your mum says you've had to miss some swimming sessions, is that right? Yes, and I want uh, to uh, uh, stop so I can uh, uh, go on um, holly uh, day. Matt's planning on going to France with his family. Yes. Sounds great. 
So Matt, the doctor needs to see a picture of the inside of your tummy so she can find out how to help stop the pain. And I've got a leaflet here that shows you how she takes the picture. Let me see. Of course. Let's talk it through together. So you'll lie down on a bed and they'll use a special camera like this one. And they put it in your mouth and then down into your tummy and they film inside your tummy. Amy starts by assuming Matthew has capacity for this decision and gives him all practicable support to enable him to make his own decision. Let's look at the functional test of capacity again in more detail to assess Matthew's ability to make a decision. He must be able to understand information about the decision to be made, retain that information, use or weigh up the information as part of his decision-making process, and communicate his decision by any means. And then you get to go home straight after they've taken the picture. Yes. So I need to check that I've explained it clearly and that you understand about it and can make a decision and sign a paper to tell the doctor that you agree. Why don't you tell Sanjeev what you've heard me say about this? They need to uh, uh, take a picture inside my tummy to see why it is sore. Then they um, can try to make it better so that I can uh, go to France. That's right. So do you agree to go to the hospital and have the picture taken? Yes. If um, uh, Sanjeev comes with me, um, Mum uh, can't come. She uh, uh, fusses um, too much. Makes me more uh, nervous. That's fine, Matt. Whatever you're comfortable with. I had some concerns about Matthew's capacity to consent to a gastroscopy procedure due to his learning disability. I visited him with his personal assistant Sanjeev today. I talked him through the procedure using easy read documents. He was able to understand the basics of the procedure and why it was needed and he was able to communicate his informed consent. And then you can go home straight after they've taken the picture. Uh, well, um, you uh, take the uh, uh, picture. No, the doctor would do that. But you need to visit the hospital because that's where the camera is. Um, uh, um, can't mum uh, take the... Uh, uh, picture on uh, her uh, phone. I don't think he quite understands the difference between the cameras. What if we went together to meet the people at the hospital and then we can see the camera first? Then you can decide about having the picture taken another time. What do you reckon, Matt? Would you like to visit the hospital first? Uh, yes. I'll let you know which date. Shall I text you when I know? I like um, what's an app. I can uh, see a picture then. Um, Mum can uh, help me with my uh, spelling. OK, Matt, I'll WhatsApp you when I know. He was unable to understand the basics of the procedure or why it was needed. He has agreed to visit the hospital to learn more about it. Therefore, I will delay this decision until after his visit. And then you can go home straight after they've taken the picture. I need to check that I've explained it clearly 
and that you understand about it so you can make a decision and sign a paper to tell the doctor that you agree. Why don't you tell Sanjeev what you've heard me say about this? Um, yeah. Matthew, can you tell me what you heard the nurse say about going to the hospital? Um, uh, uh, camera. Okay, tell me about the camera. Um, I've uh, g got a, uh, a camera. He wants to show you the camera on his phone. Oh, I see. The camera I'm talking about is at the hospital. Matt, why don't we look at those later? The nurse is talking to you now. Do you understand why I think you need to go to the hospital? The odd 20 bus. Let's go now. It's the bus that goes to the hospital. He knows one of the drivers. I don't think he understands the procedure or why it's necessary. If he did, he'd be able to tell you. This is usually how he shows me when he's bored or when something's a bit too much for him to take in. Matt, taking this photo at the hospital is difficult for you to understand. So I'm going to arrange a meeting with all the people who are important, maybe here at your house. And then we can all help decide what to do about this photo of your tummy. He was unable to understand the basics of the procedure or why it was needed. His long-term personal assistant Sanjeev, who knows him well, agreed. I believe he lacks capacity to consent to this procedure and that a best interests decision needs to be made. At the meeting should be Matt's mum, Sanjeev, his consultant, who will be the lead decision maker, and dietitian along with myself. I will need to prepare necessary materials and handouts for the meeting. The decision making will need to be recorded for Matt's file. Together, a decision needs to be made in Matt's best interests. Eating smaller and more frequent meals might help reduce the symptoms. In the end, my view is that without investigation and treatment, Matt is more likely to be in discomfort in the future with more indigestion. We should consider and make our decision based on the less restrictive option and involve Matt throughout the decision-making process. And I suggest we book a double appointment at the end of the afternoon so we can take extra time if necessary. This is so we can give you as much time as you need, Matt, so you can be comfortable. Following the best interest meeting, it has been decided that Matt should have a gastroscopic investigation to diagnose his stomach problem. I've arranged for him to visit the department a week before the procedure with his personal assistant Sanjeev to familiarise himself with the environment. And then for the procedure, a double appointment has been set up at the end of the working day. Sanjeev will be escorting Matt to and from his appointment and will arrange transport for the day. I have left the easy read materials with Matt so his family and Sanjeev can refer to it to prepare him. Making a best interests decision is a process of constructing the decision that person is likely to have made if they had capacity to make it. This process should be proportionate and specific to the decision needed. A lasting power of attorney helped in Lynn's scenario and in Matthew's case a decision about a surgical procedure warranted a multidisciplinary best interests meeting with his mother as family advocate. The more significant the decision, the more preparation is required. We've seen how to apply the principles of the Mental Capacity Act. I just need to check with you what you heard me say about. Me. And how to undertake the functional test of capacity. If a person can understand the basics of the decision, retain it long enough to weigh up the options and communicate their decision, then they have capacity for that decision at that time. If they cannot understand, retain, weigh up the options or communicate their decision by any means, you have shown that they lack capacity for that decision at that time. Then the decision must be made by their attorney for health and welfare, their court-appointed deputy or collectively in their best interests. Both advocacy 
and the less restrictive option must be considered. Finally, we've seen the importance of writing accurate records and uploading relevant documents to evidence your good practice. An adult life lived fully cannot be entirely free of risk. As an excellent health or social care practitioner or carer, you will want to uphold people's rights as part of your support for their well-being. Know the law and use your judgment to be outstanding at what you do.